Thank you so much. Thank you for introducing me. I will share my screen here with you so I can start talk. Uh, to be honest with you, I prepared 11 slides. That's it. I have 11 slides here for you. Um, I like to talk, so I was worried of extrapolating my time. And then I prepared this uh, amount of slides. I, I think it will be enough. And I just would like to thank you so much for having me today here with all these uh, important colleagues in forensic odontology. Uh, I already saw here in the, in the chat some colleagues. I saw Kiko and I saw students as well that are following us uh, throughout the, the conferences. And I just would really like to, to thank you once more and to congratulate all the uh, members of the organization of this uh, amazing uh, conference because we had here over the last uh, presentations, we had Beard and Topsy with uh, Emilio, we had John Berketa with his techniques, uh, very innovative techniques uh, for human identity identification. And now we had the PMCT, which is, is such an amazing topic and all the other topics that were addressed, which for me was so interesting. And I saw that we had between 150 and 200 people watching us, which uh, is amazing. So congratulations for everything. And thank you once more. So I am Ademir Franco. I'm from Brazil. Now it's 10 to 5 a.m. in Brazil. And I'm very excited to share some different topic here with the students and with the audience. And the title of my presentation today is The Importance of Research in Forensic Odontology, Practicing with Evidence-Based Tools. And then when I say practicing with evidence-based tools, I'm talking about improving our tools in practice by means of research, which is the fundamental part of uh, being a forensic odontologist. So in order to start this presentation, I decided to start with a question. So the question is, what is the importance of research in forensics? And basically, when we talk about forensics, we are talking about forensic sciences, all right? So we have a big umbrella and under the umbrella, we have different sciences. And I like this text here and I'd like to share with you. Research underpins the practice of forensic science to support its development, increase its value to the criminal justice system, and improve the efficiency with which forensic evidence is gathered by law enforcement agencies, processed by forensic science providers, and presented to the courts. So basically, what Silverman and his co-authors are describing here in this text is the importance of having research to uh, support our tools in the forensic practice. Soon we will uh, go in detail in forensic odontology and I would like to discuss with you some of the tools that we are using nowadays that we used in the past and that we are planning to use in the future. And these tools are migrating from a very fundamental development that we saw in the past to a more advanced practice. We just saw uh, Selena here presenting the PMCT. In the past, we didn't have this notion of using CT for human identification. And now we are discussing the possibilities of dual energy CT, which is amazing. And we are talking about the application of Interpol codes uh, with 3D imaging, multiplanar navigation. So it's amazing. All those things we can do now are very advanced, right? Uh, one of the things that I also would like to highlight here, I always say that the acknowledgements and the, the compliments, they should be public. I would like to share and to express my gratitude here to Emilio because uh, he's constantly offering new opportunities to those that are interested in, in researching forensic odontology. So I'm talking about research in forensic odontology and I must highlight the importance of this uh, professional in, in the field. So thank you, Emilio, for that. 
uh, as you presented me in the beginning, as you introduced myself uh, to the audience, uh, most of my practice in forensic odontology is related to human identification, age estimation, bite mark analysis. And in Brazil, I had the chance of getting involved with several um, consultancies for malpractice cases. But in parallel, I always was involved with research and teaching. And research actually was part of what was most of my activities in forensic odontology. And when I talk about research in forensic odontology, I like to share this image. It's a very simple image. You can imagine as a wall, but I really would like to imagine in a horizontal way as a bridge. So we are bridging gaps in science. And ideally, we are linking the obscure with the light, which is knowledge. So we are trying to walk towards the, the light. And with this image, I just would like to say that um, our task as forensic odontologists is to develop our field. And sometimes I hear some colleagues saying that they are bite mark analysts or they are dental age estimation experts. But to be honest, there's no such a thing as a bite mark analyst. You are a forensic odontologist before anything. So the courses that are provided uh, in Dundee, for example, or in Belgium or in Australia or elsewhere, these courses, they have in their program uh, the fundamental pillars of forensic odontology, which are human identification, dental age estimation, bite mark analysis, and maybe malpractice or something like that. And our task, as I said, is to find solutions for the specific gaps that we'll find in our fields. So as I saw, for example, uh, Selena was saying that the PMCT emerged as a powerful tool for her routine, and now they are experimenting, they are improving, so they're, they're bridging a gap that is appearing. And other colleagues as well, the Verdentopsy project is another example, and the other presentations that were provided are bridging gaps in science. And sometimes the contribution that you have to bridge or to fill that specific gap uh, is very important. So you have a very big brick to place in that uh, position. So your contribution is extremely relevant. Sometimes is a simple contribution, but is important as well. So it doesn't matter. What is important is contributing somehow to building this specific bridge that I am talking about. Well, but then we uh, must address a specific thing in research methodology, okay? I know that some of the students here are studying forensic odontology at master level. Some students, they are in a higher level, maybe PhD or other students are in a, in a basic level, undergraduation maybe. And then uh, maybe you already had contact with research methodology, which, which is one of the most important disciplines that we have in, in a master course or in a PhD course. And the research methodology is telling you how you should find the best uh, design for your study. And in the past, what we had were the cases of empiricism growing in forensic odontology, growing in forensic pathology, medicine in other fields. So basically people were learning from their own experiences. They had one autopsy, so they learned a little bit. Another dental autopsy, a little bit more. So they were learning a little more with the cases that they had in practice. But what we have nowadays is something more advanced so forensic odontology is migrating from the empiricism of the past to more advanced scientific methods. For example, one a very advanced method is the hypothetical deductive method, which was proposed by Karl Popper, which is the person in the bottom of this slide. So Karl Popper proposed a research method in which you have a problem and then you'll have a hypothesis for that specific problem and you need to test 
that hypothesis. And after testing that hypothesis, what you get is another problem. So being a researcher is uh, handling these kind of situations, is solving problems all the time. So you have different problems with new testings that you will have. And in the past, it was not that way. So you will learn from your experiences. That's what uh, John Locke in the upper part of this slide was proposing in the past. So this is the way in which forensic odontology uh, is describing a migration from the past to the present. But then when we think about the research methodology, we should uh, take a look at the literature, but also we should take a look in the internet just to have an idea of our own field. If you search in Google, forensic odontology, if you just type forensic odontology in Google, you'll see that in the beginning of the, the first page, you'll have some questions. And maybe uh, you'll find there this question. This question appeared uh, in my search and it was the first question that appeared. Is forensic odontology reliable? And I was a little bit concerned with this question because why are people asking if the field in which I work is reliable or not, what's the problem with my field? And then what you can see as an answer for that question is something related to bite mark. So they are talking about bite mark and we know that bite mark has limitations. I'm not going deep in that specific topic because we could talk about bite mark limitations and bite mark field for hours. But uh, the problem is, some specific areas in forensic odontology are uh, giving a bad credit to forensic odontology because of those limitations. So some people, they think that forensic odontology is sometimes, I would say in very bad words that we, we can find in the internet, like junk science, I would say. And it's not, we know that's not, but because of some specific fields, Forensic odontology is considered that way. So it's our task in here to improve our field as our colleagues were presenting their topics over the last uh, two days. And I provided here two examples of improvements, very recent improvements that we had in forensic odontology uh, by means of papers that were published in 2020. And we had... The two papers that I provided here were related to the automatization of some process that we have in the human identification uh, field. So the authors here, they were proposing automated tools in which you just need to provide the panoramic radiographs and then the software uh, were responsible for providing the best match of uh, your sample. So these were very interesting studies and they are just examples on how we can improve our field or how our field improved last year. And again, talking about the hypothetical deductive approach that I just explained, we have here this uh, drawing showing the problem, the hypothesis and the testing. Then your task as a forensic ontologist is to verify if your hypothesis is false or not. And remember, I told you in the beginning of my presentation that there's no such a thing as a bite mark analyst. So you are, before a bite mark analyst, you are a forensic odontologist. And being a forensic odontologist means that you are a researcher as well. Because in practice, you need to search and research the tools that you're going to use. One of the advantages of this method that I am showing right now is the contribution for the ac acceptance of our field in court. In some of the courts, you will find the Daubert standards. I don't know if you are aware or if you are familiar with these standards, but the Daubert standards are a set of um, pre-established things that your method should have in order to provide an evidence that is acceptable in court or not. 
So basically, the court is trying to understand if the theory, the technique, or the method that you use was tested before. They want to understand if your method was uh, published somehow and went through a process of peer review. They want to understand if you know the error rates of your methods. They want to understand if it isn't standardized. And at the end, they want to understand if your method is accepted by the scientific community. Now, if you want to translate, it, translate these things to practice, uh, just try to think about age estimation, for example. The age estimation methods that you are using uh, were tested, were peer reviewed. Do you know the error rates? Do you know the standard deviation of the method that you're using? So it's very important to know those things. If you think about bite marks, then probably you have some uh, important limitations in order to answer to those questions. During my PhD, uh, my research topic was the uniqueness of the human dentition for bite mark analysis. It was quite challenging, to be honest. And in here, in this slide, you have three examples or three chapters out of the seven that we published it, uh, that were related to um, the uniqueness of the human dentition and bite marks. So first, our first problem was, is the human dentition unique for every person? And then we decided to use uh, 3D models in a virtual environment with some uh, software navigation for, for 3D modeling. And then what we used in this first study was the six anterior teeth of both arches, but we considered all the, the crown of the tooth, which is not reliable for bite mark analysis because we are not dealing with information of all the crown. We are dealing with sizal edges and cusp tips of canines. So we solved that problem by performing that investigation, but then we had another problem, which was the amount of material that you are analyzing. The material that I was analyzing was not related to bite mark. So we decided to perform the second study here. And in the second study, we observed that the amount of material have an important, had, had an important part on determining uniqueness. To be more specific, uh, the more material you have, the higher the probability of uniqueness, of course, because you have more information of that person. And then we decided to investigate at level of bite mark analysis. So we decided to cut the information down to the incisor edges and the cusp tip of canines. So we were finding new problems and we had to find new solutions for those problems by means of testing. This is research in forensic odontology. Examples, of course. When you go to the scientific literature, you will find the pillars of forensic odontology, human identification, both for single cases or DVI, dental age estimation, bite mark analysis, and law and ethics. And some authors published a recent paper showing that most of the publications in forensic odontology are related to age estimation, and then human identification. Bite mark analysis is the third place. So these authors investigated the topics in forensic odontology that were most interesting, maybe, or most uh, prone to be published, I would say. Of course, they investigated only journals that were high ranking. So uh, maybe in other types of journals, journals that are not so in, in a higher position like those, uh, the topics would change. Related to age estimation, what was interesting is the fact that most of the studies of age estimation were performed with children and adolescents. So age estimation were uh, studied by means of permanent teeth developing and also third molars that are developing. And adults uh, consisted only of one third of those studies. So the panorama that is depicted here by these authors in 2018 uh, shows that 
research in forensic odontology is performed on demand, which means that basically people are researching things that have a stronger application in practice. We know from our experiences, maybe you'll share the same experience, that our age estimation cases are more related to asylum seekers, I would say, nowadays, right? In Brazil, we also have cases for adoption, for example. So those are cases related to children and adolescents, which is uh, in accordance with this paper. Uh, forensic odontologists are researching as well areas with divergent opinions. And bite mark analysis is the best example. In bite mark analysis, we don't have a uniform opinion about the evidence. And then having research in that specific field is extremely important for us. We need to understand how to uh, address bite mark and how to understand if these evidence will be accepted in court, if it will not, how sh we should handle the evidence. So research is extremely important for that. And of course, there are specific courses, there are specific universities that follow a very traditional research line. So the authors, they already have a, a history of publication in that specific topic. And then, of course, new studies in the topic will emerge from that specific group of researchers. In this slide here, I provide some of the papers that we published to give an example of uh, what is evidence-based tools in forensic odontology. So when I uh, came back to Brazil from Belgium after studying, uh, I noticed that here in the country, we had several cases of dental age estimation. But for some reason, uh, a large number of forensic odontologists were performing in practice methods that were not so well known, I would say, internationally. There is a method in Brazil from 1974, it's called Nicodemo, and this method was performed with an original sample of 475 individuals, and this is one of the most popular methods in the country, and the error rates are quite important, I would say, not to say scary. But then when I came back uh, to Brazil, I, I knew I had the background of Willem's method. And then I decided to test Willem's method in Brazil. I tested Willi Willem's method in a sample of healthy individuals. I tested Willem's method in a sample of HIV individuals because those HIV individuals, they, they, most of them don't have documents. They, they uh, have HIV in a vertical way, which means that they have from... Uh, their mother during birth and then they need to have an identity this is human rights right and then i tested again in another sample in another region of brazil three original studies three primary studies of williams method in brazil so the primary studies were very important at that time because we didn't have studies of williams method in the sample of brazil so we need to perform primary studies. Once we have the primary studies, we can perform another type of study, which is the secondary study. And the secondary study in this context here is the systematic review with the meta-analysis. So we performed recently a systematic review with meta-analysis in a sample of Brazilian uh, children. And what we tried to see in that specific systematic review was what is the best method to apply in Brazilian children? What is the best method for age estimation when we are comparing chronological and estimated ages? And then we uh, pulled together all the papers that were published in the Brazilian population with the different uh, methods for age estimation in children. And we observed that Williams method was the best method, was the most accurate method for age estimation in children, even better than the original Brazilian method. So in here, we have some details of this systematic review. The systematic review was performed in several databases. Uh, we addressed it on the original studies, and we had, by the end, 13 studies that were eligible according to our uh, study setup, systematic review setup. 
All right. So in the right side of this slide here, you can see the new pyramid of evidence. And basically what the authors are proposing in 2016 is uh, a closer look of the primary studies. So primary studies are cohort studies, case controls, observational studies in general, experimental studies, but a closer look of those studies with a magnification lens that represents the systematic review. And this is exactly what we did in Brazil with the Williams method. And after we applied the systematic review, we had in our hands a very strong argument to propose to forensic odontologists the, the use of this method, the Williams method, in a Brazilian population, because we had three original studies and one systematic review. So this is the way that we built our rationale behind our studies. And again, over the last years, I got involved with the systematic review process because I think it's quite a very interesting way to have a closer look of the science that we are performing in forensic odontology. And all these papers that you were seeing here were systematic reviews in different topics of forensic odontology. In green, you can see the systematic reviews that confirmed the technique. So the systematic review is saying, okay, this is very good, this is reliable in practice. In yellow, you can see a systematic review that is uncertain related to the outcome. It's saying, look, bite mark analysis, uniqueness of the human dentition related to bite mark analysis is not yet confirmed. So it's yellow, you should take care. And in red, we publish it, systematic reviews that are saying, take care. Now you're stepping in a very dangerous ground because, for example, Palatal rugoscopy is not that reliable for sexual dimorphism as people may think, okay? I'm not saying that it's useless, no. I'm just saying that we should use in uh, as a, a contribution to other techniques, all right? So we are just saying take care because uh, palatal rugoscopy may have some important limitations. And in the right side here, the message is, Systematic reviews contribute to development of evidence-based tools, even if the theory, technique, or the method is not validated after testing. So you are filtering tools. When we say that uh, we are using evidence-based tools, it means that we are using the tools that we saw that are very accurate or are very relevant for forensic odontology. But we are also saying that we are not using the tools that are dangerous, that could have some important risk, for example, for our practice. So these are the roles of uh, systematic reviews. Well, and in here, I'm just remembering you what I told in the beginning of this presentation, that the, the criticism behind forensic odontology may come from layperson, for example, in Google, the question that I, I read to you, is forensic odontology reliable? Yeah, we know that it is, but depending on the field, it could have some important limitations. Criticism may emerge from our peers, our forensic odontologists, colleagues. So this is the National Academy of Science of the United States, the report provided in 2009, showing the limitations in specific fields in forensic science. And you'll definitely find bite mark in that report. So criticism may emerge from laypersons or from experts in the field. And the criticism should emerge as well from your own practice. So Professor uh, Berketa, for example, he noticed that in his practice, he uh, had to work with several cases of child bodies or carbonization. And he noticed that he needed something to stabilize the teeth so he could uh, take x-rays, for example. And then his own criticism on that uh, made necessary the development of the tool that he presented today. All right. And in this graph here, you can see the progressive publication of studies in forensic odontology over the years. And you can see that 
in 2011, we have the highest number of publications in forensic odontology. But in the red line in the graph is showing the year of publication of the NAS report 2009, the report that criticized bite marks. See, now we have in practice a clear example of the criticism. So in 2009, we had criticism in forensic odontology. And two years later, we had a lot more papers in forensic odontology, which is very important for us. So criticizing uh, the work that we perform in forensic odontology is normal and should serve to trigger more studies in the field. All right, so criticism from the academy or not on specific fields of forensic odontology contributes to the development of evidence-based tools. And this is the topic of this presentation. Uh, we have right now 29 minutes of presentation and this is my last slide. I'm glad to follow my time strictly here. And lessons learned so far. Evidence-based tools may increase the reliability of techniques that we use in forensic odontology. Good. Second, evidence-based tools may have a direct impact on the admissibility of the evidence in court. This is the case of bite mark, for example. So far, so good. But then we have two important points here. Systematic reviews may be a dangerous tool in forensics. And one of the things here that we noticed is there are specific fields in forensic odontology that we know are limited. And one of those fields, I will not say bite mark again, I will say estimating the stature of someone using tooth measurements. It's quite uh, uncertain, I would say. We know that is uncertain, but if 20 authors publish their own outcomes or that specific topic, and they say this technique is good, if, if you perform a systematic review, guess what will be the outcome? The outcome will, will be that this technique is good. So before the systematic review, what you need to do is having a preliminary search of the papers to see the quality of the paper. If you see the quality of the papers are not that good, maybe a systematic review will be dangerous in that context. And the last uh, lesson here is systematic reviews may not be the best study design for the topic. I told you Williams method word was never applied in Brazil before. So if I proposed at that time a systematic review, it would be useless. I should wait for preliminary and primary studies to be published so I could perform a secondary study in the form of a systematic review. So those are the four main messages of this presentation. I would like to thank you so much for your attention once more.